we're in a tech bubble or are we on the verge of a tech revolution where uh, technology just impacts everything today and it's just going to continue to explode and so this bubble is not going to burst. Uh, who would like to, uh, David, I see you hand, uh, going for the mic there. Uh, no, I don't think we're in the middle of a tech bubble or entering a tech bubble. I think what you're seeing is something that is best exemplified by New York City, which is why we're all here. So New York City historically was not a tech center of the world. There were no chip fab plants here. There were no uh, giant wet labs. This wasn't Boston, this isn't Silicon Valley. Um, so when, when many of us who were here in New York uh, first started, I started the computer class from 1983. There was nothing here. But now take a look, New York City, A, you're all here, but B, New York City is the fastest growing tech center in the world right now. And why is that? Well, because what you're seeing is technology has effectively escaped the lab it's, it has escaped the the, uh, the little guys, you know, coding in the middle of a uh, of a, a coding den, um, and is now applying to everything. And New York happens to be the capital of everything. Yeah. Right? It's the capital of the of the finance world and the advertising world and the fashion world and the food world. And so, therefore, New York has become the center of hyphen tech, fintech, fashion tech, food tech, market tech, and tech. And that's what you're seeing around the world. You're seeing technology now applied to everything. And so this is going to accelerate exponentially. Okay. Uh, uh, I think that's a, a um, very smart perspective. I, I think it's useful to um, also separate what we mean by tech bubble in terms of innovation versus valuation. I think in many ways this is a technology renaissance. Um, from an innovation perspective. Um, there's amazing technologies being created all around the world, uh, you know, particularly in Silicon Valley, China, and Israel. From a valuation perspective, though, uh, I do get concerned about some of what we're seeing. Now, on the one hand, um, you know, as long as strategic buyers are you know, paying you know, very large amounts for startups, you know, why not see valuations creep up, creep up a bit? But on the other hand, you know, just from a sort of fundamentals perspective, not every company is going to get bought for $2 billion or $10 billion by Facebook or Google or the four or five people globally who can buy you for that amount of money. Eventually, if you are not going to get acquired by one of those companies, you're going to have to go public um, or be sold for a lower amount. And valuation is going to be dependent at that point in time on your fundamentals. You know, ultimately, Warren Buffett's right, uh, fundamentals eventually matter, <laughs> right? And um, so that's, that's where I get a little concerned from a valuation perspective about us being in a bubble. I think from an innovation perspective, though, it's, it's, it's very impressive what's going on these days. I would just say that in terms of the, I agree with you, but in terms of the valuation bubble, we're talk, how many companies are we talk about here that are being bought for $2 billion and valued at $17 billion, like, like Uber and Instrument? I mean, such a, there are 700,000 employer businesses that are started every year in the United States. 700,000 businesses. How many of those do you read about that in crazy you know, uh, valuations? You know, de minimis. Right. It's kind of interesting. I don't think about it as a technology revolution. I think about it as a creativity revolution where people are just being more opportunistic about fixing problems that we see. And people are young people, particularly, um, who tend to be entrepreneurs, as somebody once described the living on hopium, um, are looking for opportunities to fix those problems in a creative way. It turns out that they're growing up as coders. They're turning you know, towards the internet as the space by which they can collaborate and find things that they can work on with others. So I think we over-dramatize a lot of this, like over-dramatizing the tech bubble over dramatizing the tech revolution. Um, I sit here in awe of some venture capitalists, you know, Harry over here who was very much a part of the early boom of tech when it was called computers, right, back in the 80s. Uh, and the first iteration of the internet space back in, you know, the 90s. We're just evolving. And I don't think about it as a revolution. And frankly, also as a bubble, you know, if every angel investor or VC lost all their money, we'd still have our yachts and nothing would change. You know, bubbles only happen when the people who can't afford to lose their money, which of course happened last time, lose it because they ran in so late. Harry, would you like to make some comment on that question? Yeah, uh, I'm Shanghai Base, and we run a firm, uh, a private equity firm that's in growth equity in the consumer sector. And uh, of course, the big deal in China is all about e-commerce. 
driven on the backs of the stories of Alibaba or Jin Dong's recent IPO and the IP shop that have done so, so well successfully. Um, and I think uh, what we're finding in, in China at least is that a lot of companies are sort of repositioning themselves with an E angle when in fact they really are not an E angle. And so they believe that by doing so they become a lot higher in valuation and they're asking for a lot more money. And I think that's really um, uh, not the right thing to do. Uh, we are also concerned about valuation, to your point. We believe that, the, um, the, that there, there is a sense of um, irrationality in the market where, um, where just because they're redressed or repositioned or repackaged that they can theoretically ask for a significant premium. Um, the other thing that would worry us about the tech bubble in China is that uh, everybody talks about O to O, online to offline. Everybody talks about this omni-channel strategy. And, uh, and the more I ask about this strategy, the more I ask about, well, where's the O to O angle, you know, the more I, I realize it's, it's kind of like high school sex, right? Everybody claims that they had it, but fully, like, nobody really knows for sure what it was or what it is that they're doing. And, and that's what worries me also, but it's really a traditional model for asking e-commerce valuations, and I think that's where a bubble may, may uh, be uh, prevalent. Okay, Tony? Tony, we'd love to have your view on sure. that too. Sure. Um, so, uh, just in terms of our purview, uh, you know, NA is a large global firm. Uh, you know, we have about thirteen million dollars now that we manage, and it's across stages. So, seed, early stage venture capital, and growth equity. It's uh, we're based both in the East Coast and the West Coast here in the U.S., and also with offices in China and India, and growing portfolios all over the world. So, we have a bit of a global perspective, and I would say that. Um, a lot of what was just said it resonates with, with us. You know, there's the innovation cycle, we think in the enterprise is still at the early innings. We're uh, fundamentally really excited about what we're seeing in, um, in enterprise software and enterprise technology. Uh, the cost of starting consumer companies is super low today and the innovation cycle is significant and the power of the mobile platform is uh, it's still in its early stages. And so we're really excited about very large companies being able to be created uh, going forward um, in, out of that. I think, you know, we, we actually are, you know, somewhat cautious in certain po pockets of uh, technology from a valuation perspective. I think that uh, the risk that we see, uh, you know, as investors is that what happens is the average companies tend to get, you know, above average valuations in, in markets like we're seeing. Um, there's a lot of capital today. Uh, a lot of capital that's coming to the market that you know wasn't here you know five six seven eight years ago um, and uh, a lot of competition gets funded and so in markets where you have you know winner take all dynamic you know you do see uh, you know some extreme you know behavior from a valuation perspective and I think that's what's what's occurring but fundamentally we're, we're still very uh, we're very active from an investment standpoint which I think suggests that you know we think we're in a really good environment uh, but you know we have some caution around that, and I think the public markets are what probably clue us in the most. And we've seen sort of a reset uh, from the last you know peak where we were in the springtime, and we think that's been a healthy reset. It takes the private markets a, a, a lot longer to kind of adjust, and we think that's you know, slow, slowly happening. Uh, we've heard tonight many examples of entrepreneurs who are actually not taking venture capital, not taking the the traditional route. Uh, and we've seen the emergence of crowdfunding and some of the entrepreneurs who have gone uh, to crowdfunding for sources of finance. Uh, what do you think uh, about the future of venture capital and its effectiveness and is the venture capital model broken or needs repair of some sort? Uh, because we've seen these angels come in, angels are getting a lot of good deals, crowdfunding is having its impact today. Uh, what's What's the future for venture capital, uh, the model of investing? Uh, well, I work for an equity crowdfunding platform called Our Crowd, which is based in Israel. Um, and I don't think the VC model is dead at all. In fact, I think it's thriving. And we actually like to partner with venture capital. We think if we, because we bring over 5,000 investors to the table in every deal, uh, add significant value to transactions, uh, and make a good partner for venture capital firms. Um, Why do you think it's thriving? Uh, well, I think there's a tremendous amount of 
investment on the part of VCs. I don't think the model is broken. I mean, they have tremendous amounts of capital to deploy. So it's just more capital good, that's what you're saying? What's out there. I mean, it's helping companies grow. Aren't they in the exit business? Uh, I mean, I think, I think most people are in the exit business. <laughs> <laughs> so are, yeah. they, are, they, are they getting their exits? I mean, is, I, don't, I don't see what the problem with that is. Uh, well, you know, the issue of a model being broken is a question of whether or not the formula that is the end result is working. Is it working? You're saying it's thriving. Is it working? Because according to a Kauffman Foundation, at least in the most recent study, over the last 10 years, the venture capital world hasn't made a penny. Well, so, 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 so jumping in here for, for a second, I, I think there are clearly challenges with the traditional venture capital model. On the other hand, the venture capital model itself is changing. The idea of micro VC funds, seed funds, um, quote, super angel funds, unquote, did not exist, what, 10 years, 15 years ago? I mean, uh, uh, there were a couple of, of I mean, first round capital, a couple others were the, were the very earliest ones out there, and they're, they're less than 10 years old. Um, now you see a, a lot of these, if you look at a lot of the companies that are having these mega exits, um, they were seed funded by things that smell, that they're called seed funds, but they're venture capital, it's a different kind. And what you're seeing is the traditional world of, of venture capital is tends to be moving upstream because it's very difficult to you know, take 10, 20, you know, $50 million uh, and get into something from somewhere else other than that. I think the recent statistic in Silicon Valley last quarter, at least what I saw, is that seed capital into um, startups, there's only six companies, that's it, just six. It's it's six companies. There was only six, six companies. Funds. Six companies that were C financed that were startups. Yeah, and all of Silicon Valley last quarter. Hmm. No. Just six. But, uh, I, CB I, and CB I, and You, you may very well be. It's you know it sounds like a, an interesting statistic. I don't I don't know what I qualify C investing, but um, in that in that regard. But yeah, look, I mean, I think you know, like all capital markets and. Um, you know, investment-based markets. You know, I think the VC industry is evolving. Um, I think you know, we, our perspective would be that there's uh, room for um, you know lots of healthy returns in, in different parts of this market. I think we think the angel trend has been healthy, and of course, you know, angels function in a very different capacity than a, you know an NEA or an RRE or you know other professional um, kind of long-term investors. Uh, but we, we, a lot of our companies, a lot of our entrepreneurs benefit from angel investing and seed investors that are focused on that market. We uh, have very deep relationships with a lot of those funds and, and work quite, quite well with them. Uh, we've architected ourselves um, uh, at one extreme of the model, which is to get you know scale and be global. Um, I think what we see in the market is it's more bifurcating, consolidating. The traditional institutional venture capital market we think is Consolidating the statistics bear that out, uh, both in terms of capital formation and fund formation. And I think, you know, firms that are smaller and perhaps you know more specialized and however they want to define that specialization, seem to be really thriving. Uh, and then large-scale firms that are perhaps more, you know, both, both by scale of capital and breadth of activity, breadth of stage, and then um, in particular being global, uh, also seem to be growing and aggregating. And I think that the but the benchmark for that is, you know, ultimately, you know, returns. And because at the end of the day, you know, we're only as good as our returns are limited partners, and that's what we tend to focus on. And I think if you look at the, the sort of the top 10 or 15 larger firms, they all seem to be aggregating more and more assets under management. And you have a, uh, a large number of smaller firms that are probably sub $500 million funds, uh, you know, like a bunch of them here in New York, uh, Jim's fund, that, that seem to be doing really well, better than they were even 10 years ago. So we think the, the health of uh, both sides of that market are improving, uh, and, and that's the benefit that we see as a consolidation. But, you know, look, I think, um, you know, what we're seeing in crowdfunding is also, all of this is in our mind good for entrepreneurs, it's good for innovation, it's good for risk taking, and we're really excited and, and love to partner with, uh, with all parts of the ecosystem. I, I just add to that, I completely share that perspective. I think what a lot of people forget about the venture industry is that it's an industry. It's just like any other industry. And if you're going to be good in that industry, you gotta know what you're good at. And so uh, to me, as you know, somebody who ran a startup that exited and then actually founded another startup here in New York, 
it, it's no different than any other business that you would start or run. Uh, you have areas that you want to focus on where you believe you have a competitive advantage, and if you do indeed have a competitive advantage there, you will see better deals and back better entrepreneurs and get better returns. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think it's useful to think about the venture industry in that context. Um, and I think crowdfunding is, um, to, to your point earlier, just uh, a, a good development overall for entrepreneurs that allows more entrepreneurs to fund their ideas and allows uh, venture investors to select from a wider pool of potential investment opportunities. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think the interesting question about crowdfunding is not going to be, is it good for entrepreneurs? Because I think it clearly is. The question is going to be, is it good for investors? And is anybody actually going to make any money um, in sort of non-accredited crowdfunding investing? Which I think is a very open question. Since it hasn't started yet in the in the U.S., it's not legal here yet. Uh, but we're seeing equity funding platforms now for accredited investors who are doing some very interesting kinds of stuff. Um, if you look at the at the major equity funding platforms, um, they've had. They are, they are serving the market of the traditional accredited investor. Once you start getting to the, to the non-accredited investor, uh, courtesy of the Jobs Act, the Title III, um, the jury, I think, is, is, what, is out because it hasn't gone into operations yet because nobody starts it. But I think it's going to be easy for people to get swayed. And hopefully, the regs that they put into this are going to make it um, you know, viable to get money for, for entrepreneurs without totally screwing up the whole finances of the 40 people who are so. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you. We uh, only uh, are open to accredited investors, but I think you know, crowdfunding is good for everybody because we, you know, act pretty nimbly, which is good for companies, and we're amenable to working with venture capital firms. So at the end of the day, startups and entrepreneurs are still getting capital uh, and access to, you know, angel investors. So I think everybody wins. So for an entrepreneur, uh, how do they how do they tackle the question of who to go to to raise finance from? Is it just uh, first one that they can tap? Uh, maybe crowdfunding, or can an angel investor offer more than a, than a traditional VC? Uh, what's it, 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 I would say that in the real world, it's not that you have a whole lot of choices, right? I mean, the kind, the kind of company that might be able to, to raise you know ten fifteen thousand bucks through a Kickstarter campaign is likely not going to be funded by NEA you know tomorrow morning. Uh, and so we, we all tend to play in different parts of the spectrum. And so there is a role for, for rewards-based pre-sale crowdfunding. There is a, a role, I think, ultimately to be played by non-accredited crowdfunding. There certainly is a role to be played by uh, accredited, um, you know, which is really angel investing uh, in funding platforms where, where you're, you know, angel investors do $25 billion a year in the U.S. alone, which is the same as, as VCs do. There's a, a role for, for seed funds. There's a role for, for, for a certain later stage funds. And a company typically is going to be in one of these boxes. I mean, if you're, if you're the kind of company that can get it from any day, you're not going to be doing crowdfunding. And if, and if you, uh, so, so it's not a whole lot of choices there. Okay. Yeah, I believe that angels are part of the success of a startup. I think everybody agrees that if you find smart money and the angels are part of the collaborative enterprise, you're really moving the company forward dramatically. I see it the New York Angels an enormous number of recent exits, and I could, I could just see the, the smiles on the faces of the angels because they played an important role in it. I think it's going you know, belly to belly with uh, uh, the startup to be able to work with them to make those kinds of things happen. I think when you lose the personal contact, I'm not going to sound old here, I think you lose a lot. Uh, crowdfunding is an important part of the Petri dish at this point. We're all sort of trying to figure out what role they're going to play. But I think it sort of ends up becoming sort of supportive of the company that they actually have. And I don't think there's enough um, uh, challenging uh, of what the company is up to. I think it's too much of a promotional direction. And an angel group, particularly when I think of it um, from the standpoint of a devil's advocate environment, you get that. You get everybody challenging each other and, and saying, well, that's an idiotic idea. Why would you do something like that? But you don't get that as much online. I hope we can. I hope that's built into the equation of crowdfunding at some point. If I could just add to that, my advice to an entrepreneur would be to uh, raise money in this order if you have the option. <clears throat> Friends and family first, then angel, and then venture. And I'm saying this as a guy who runs a venture firm, so that sounds weird, but the reason is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, your friends and family will give you money because they love you. An angel will give you money because they love the space that you're investing in or they love something about, you know, um, a venture investor, you know, it's a business, and uh, you know we have LPs, and 
you know, uh, we get measured based on our returns, and uh, as such, there is more, there's a higher threshold, and there are more protections that we need to put in place before we give an entrepreneur money. And so for you as the entrepreneur, sometimes, you know, that is less advantageous than if you would have gotten the same amount of money from, you know, your dad or a rich uncle or whatever, right? Because they're just giving you money because they love you. So, um, you know, if, if you have your druthers, that's how you should try to raise money in that order. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I mean that, that is the canonical sequence for raising money. That's typically the only money you're going to be able to raise. If you're at the friends and family stage, you're not going to be raising money from a VC. So that's all you can get, and it's the money you should be getting. And then from angels, and then from VCs all the way up. So it, it actually works. It does. Okay. Uh, so we have two authors here who have written books on angel investing. And uh, I, think, I, I think we brought this book on too. <laughs> and, uh, they're entrepreneurs as well. Uh, yeah, they're entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> Kissing cousins. We actually absorb each other's books. Uh, they, they both headed up New York Angels too, so they've been on parallel paths. Um, what, what words of advice would you have for entrepreneurs out there approaching you for finance? But, and what's the number one mistake that you see uh, entrepreneurs making? Just yeah, it's really remarkable. I love to see an entrepreneur who's in control, who actually knows what they're doing relative to the fundraising that has already queried a lot of the input that we've just presented to you. So when they come into the conversation, they know exactly what kinds of terms they're looking for. They reviewed all the issues. Now, why? Why is it so important? An entrepreneur that's in control of their fundraise is giving you a signal that they're really going to be in control of their business too. The fundraise is exactly just one strategic element of what is going to create success for them. So when I see an entrepreneur confused, asking stupid questions, I ask myself, why? Why are they so confused? Why haven't they done some of the initial homework? New York City, at least, is one giant accelerator here. You can go everywhere. We're always available to offer input anytime. So if you come and you ask for money and you present yourself in such an uncanny fashion as to look out of control, that immediately puts you in a bad place. Yeah, that, that, let me echo that. The, there is now, what we've seen in just in the last decade is so much information available about entrepreneurship, starting companies, angels, VCs, getting funding. I mean, 20 years ago, this was a total black hole. I mean, I, I got my, my first uh, venture investment um, in 1991 from Warburg Pinkus. I didn't have, I actually fell backwards and didn't know I was raising money when I got an venture investment. And I did not have a clue because there was, there was no, not a single book, class, course, anything about what the hell a VC was, how you raise money, what you had to look like. And so, you know, luckily I had a great VC who was, you know, totally straight and walked me through the whole process and I, and I began to learn. Today, for an entrepreneur to approach any potential investor without really understanding everything about the process, about starting a business, about what investors look for, about what it takes to run a company and how you build your team and, and how you find product market fit, um, it, that's a sign that, that they weren't even looking because you, you really have to be sort of deaf, dumb, and blind not to get some kind of, of, of free resource that can tell you everything and hand walk you all Watch system. your TED talk. Watch my TED talk. I had a pitch of VC, but 700,000 downloads so far. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to chime in on that topic? Okay. I, I yes. mean, I, look, I, I think it's all right. I, I think uh, I would just add know your audience, you know, and, okay. and uh, you know, be very uh, as, as specific as you can about what you're trying to accomplish. We, we have a, a wide variety of markets represented here, uh, world markets. Uh, which of these markets is the best place for startups to thrive today? Or does there have to be a choice? Is it startup global today? Uh, you could do it anywhere. Are there particular markets that you think are excelling now that entrepreneurs should be you know, putting more <coughs> time and talent and money into? I don't want to talk about that. So I even feel free to jump in. We know you have a New York bias, but, but you know. no, 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 but, but more than that. I mean, we, you know, 20 years ago, when, when I started my first tech company in New York City, when I got my first venture investment, the first thing, so here I am in New York City, I was invested by Robert Pincus, who's a New York based VC fund, and their first thing said was, okay, where are you going to move? I said, what? They said, well, I mean, you clearly can't be a tech company based in New York because there's no tech industry here. So they wanted me to move to like Princeton at the very least, go over to, to, to Jersey or, or, or and so we did one of these surveys and you know, with these experts and said, oh, you really should be in you know, Seattle or be there in Boston or London. Or, so I ended up staying in New York because I'm a New Yorker. But, but, but those times have changed. We are not now in this total you know, Marshall McLuhan global village where anybody can start anything anywhere and equally successful. 
but we're getting there pretty darn fast, right? So, so you know, 10 years ago, I think anybody here would have said, you really should consider moving to Boston or moving to, 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 to the Valley. You know, now we are actually are seeing a bunch of companies come from California to New York to do it, which would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. Um, you know, if you're if you're now you know based in Kansas or in the middle of, of, of Botswana, is it easier to find resources and funding and and, and partners and employees in a tech center? Yeah, but they but just you know Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, Silicon Prairie, Silicon Farm, whatever the hell they are. I mean, that you know you are now seeing the emergence of these centers, regional centers um, around the world, and so we are in. The, so I would say that at this point, it doesn't make sense for somebody to move somewhere else to start a company. Okay. Um, so. All right. Uh, what special advantages does New York City offer? Does, and is New York City a better place? For a startup than Silicon Valley today? So I'm born and raised here, Flatbush, New York. So of course I'm a New York snob, and I love to debate those issues, Silicon Valley people. Um, I did have an office there for some 30 years. But the, the, the sociability issue here for a startup is critical. It's a lonely thing. And the bar scene, I'm hearing, is just extraordinary for the young people. <laughs> don't laugh, don't laugh. You know, the, the fact is, you cannot create a great company without some kind of an environment. Even when I go up and down Calper on, on, on University in Palo Alto, where are the kids? They're all hanging out in bars, and they're all working together, and all talking and drinking together. There's a collaborative sense of sociability that happens in New York that doesn't happen anywhere else. The ease of conversation, the ease of hugging in New York, which I think is one of the greatest assets that New York has. People have helped build the New York City startup community, like David and others, were very sincere, warm-hearted people. And there is this non-click attitude of welcoming here that is overwhelming. It's like old Hollywood. The kids are coming in from foreign countries. I was at General Assembly a couple of months ago, and a report from the Times said to me, what's going on? There's a lot of international startups you know, coming here. And I said, it's like Hollywood. They're coming with their suitcase. With, they got a t-shirt and a pair, pair of jeans. And they're saying, I'm going to reach my dream here in New York. And they can because it has that wonderful young culture here that they really deserve to have around being lonely. Um, 42 million people work independently now in the United States, and New York City keeps them less from that loneliness by being in a place that is fun to be in. That's a good point. Yeah, could I chime in? Yeah, okay. sure. So, um, all right, so, so, so uh, I'm based in San Francisco. My investment firm invests in companies in emerging markets, brick markets and mint markets, right? All emerging markets. And I founded a startup based here in New York City. So what the hell is going on, right? Um, I would say that you can start a business anywhere in this world, uh, but there are different places to start different types of businesses. What do I mean by that? There is a reason why, do you guys know what Zillow is? There's a reason why Zillow is not the Zillow of China. It's kind of called SoFun. Why is SoFun the Zillow of China? Well, it's because for that type of business, you have to have relationships with local real estate developers, and you, know, you have to have housing inventory to show to your consumers, and so it makes sense to start that business in China. There are some businesses that are inherently local in nature, and so you need to start them near where your customer base is and your supplier base is. There are other businesses that are global in nature. The company I started here in, uh, in New York called Marco Polo. It's, uh, it's the number one mobile education app for kids in 70 countries. You can start that here because it's that type of business, right? Um, so I think, you know, whether it's Silicon Valley or New York, there's different advantages to both. You know, plenty of great startups coming out of Silicon Valley. There's plenty of other great startups coming out of New York. And there's different advantages that each geography has. So it really depends on the type of business that you're starting. You moved back here from Hong Kong to New York because of the type of business that you're starting. It makes more sense to be here. Um, so that's that's yeah. kind of my take on this. Two thirds of our customers between Washington and Boston, right? So this this whole corridor of New York, particularly, get close to your customers. The best thing that a startup can do. Question to me. <laughs> it's your tour. That's a good thing. <laughs> Harry from Shanghai perspective. Uh, I don't have a New York City bias, so I guess um, I could only come at it from um, the companies that we've looked at and uh, what competitive differentiations they had and why we invested. 
Um, it really does come down to what the business model is and then whether you're really creating something of value. Um, we, for example, are now uh, have invested into China's largest e-commerce company. Uh, it's China's largest fruit to uh, B2C fruit uh, delivery system. Uh, and we're also investors in uh, China's second largest online pharmacist. And, um, and we're an investors into the Shanghai version of Fresh Direct. Uh, now, uh, the reason why we've done these deals is simply because um, we believe that there's a macro theme about concerns in China for food safety, pollution, air quality, um, and with a rising middle class, and as they have higher disposable income, the desire for better premium, organic, healthier products uh, have emerged. And so, as I was reflecting on the comments that were made here a moment ago, I guess one of the entrepreneurs lived overseas for a while and he took his expertise and knowledge of the imported food market and expertise and brought that to China and created a very, very successful company for himself. And that's the Fresh Direct model. Uh, the second example was a very, very successful entrepreneur that had been successful in the UK and saw the emergence of consumer healthcare and how that changed and did a lift and shift and brought that experience to China. Uh, a fourth company that we've invested into is a company called B5M. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember a company called My Simon back in the early 90s. I was sold to see them for $800 million. That same entrepreneur uh, went on to come back to Shanghai and started another company with similar algorithm, uh, repositioned, recreated himself, layered himself with a bunch of localized managers, and now have built a company that is on the Alexa ranking, uh, number 56 in the world ahead of VIP shop, ahead of Chuna, and ahead of some of the other companies in terms of website conversion ratios and so forth. And um, we were Series A's investors, and, um, and uh, the, the recent markup is uh, almost 10x. So, so therefore, I, I would say where you're based, I guess, would really depend on your marketplace and what sort of uh, expertise and perspective you bring. And ideally, if you bring a global perspective, I think you really have the advantage of seeing around the corner a little bit. And, uh, and we look for that in some of the managers that we've backed. Since I wrote a book with the subtitle, How China is Winning the Tech Race, I have to ask, is that really um, a good premise uh, or not? Is China winning the tech race? Uh, I think it's going to be a very, very long debate, right? Um, there, there's the old premise and perception that China is a very, very good place to um, copycat and uh, fabricate existing innovation from around the world. I think more and more uh, we're beginning to see the end of a copycat China, and more and more we're starting to see innovation come out of China at a lightning pace. Um, one example that I think we talked about over lunch is that we we, we looked at about 100 companies in the garment space recently uh, in the last couple of years. And I would say that a few of these companies are probably a few seasons away from getting it right. In other words, the um, you know, big debate is why doesn't China have its own luxury brand? Why is it only Shanghai Tang that's really not even mainland Chinese? And so um, uh, the OEMs that we've looked at recently have been manufacturing from, for companies like Zizenya or Gucci uh, for, for many, many years, and they are now starting to take that OEM expertise and starting to create their own brand. Now, they may not have the spelling right, the soap bar tags right, the hang tags, the proposition, the whole user experience may not be there yet, but they're probably just a couple of seasons from getting it right. And so I think that you're gonna see more and more innovation coming out of China, uh, and this is what we think is very incredibly exciting, and this is what uh, our firm backs. Uh, because we think that um, the consumption story in China is irreversible. I think uh, it's not a question of when the 270 million middle class today will become 550 million. It's only a question of when. Um, uh, McKinsey's study recently is showing that by the year 2020, for the first time, the middle class and the mass uh, middle of the pyramid class will converge, intersect, and overtake each other. That is going to have a fundamental shift in the way the Chinese consumer story uh, plays out. Um, that's going to uh, that's been being driven by urbanization. It's dri being driven by once they urbanize and everything else that comes along with what they buy and that's associated with it. And that's why um, we're very excited about the China consumption story. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful perspective. Um, to your question about is China winning, I think that's a little bit of a loaded question. Um, there is no doubt 
that, in my mind, um, China is one of the three innovation centers in the world, from at least from a consumer internet perspective, without question. Um, so I invested in a company called YY in China, which is now a four or five billion dollar market cap company. They're doing wonderfully. They're unlike anything that you would see in the United States. I mean, it's a bizarre business to many people in the US, but it's wonderfully innovative. And um, you are now, why is this happening? Why is this innovation happening in China now? It's because you've gone through this cycle, much like what happened in Silicon Valley over the last you know, 30 or 40 years of plenty of multi-billion dollar exits, right? So you're talking about Baidu, you're talking about um, Sina, Sohu, Netties, there are billions and billions of dollars of market cap. Tencent, all these companies have gone public. People who have worked at those companies have then left post the liquidity event and started their own startups, and now those companies are really innovating on a global stage. Xiaomi, uh, UC Web, there are several companies that are starting to become multi-geography winners coming out of China, which has never happened before, right? So I think China, Chinese technology innovation is entering the global stage in a big way. Historically, we've always heard about the Googles who become uh, global players, the Yahoo's, the Facebooks. I think you'll increasingly see some Chinese companies, um, you know, replicate um, replicate that achievement. Um, whether well, that means they're public. winning or not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, YY it's, recently went public and uh, talked about the unique business model for YY. Oh, it's, how do you even explain it? If you were to if you were to combine, you tell me if you think this is an accurate description. Um, so I was, I was incredibly attracted to this business. I, I used to run uh, the Facebook of Russia, um, which I sold to Mailru. Um, and so when I came across YY while I was a tiger, um, it's just a phenomenal business. So this is a company that if you were to combine Skype, uh, a karaoke concert, and like Xbox Live, all in the same business, that's kind of what it is. And so to give some perspective here, this is why I like uh, investing in emerging markets. They're so interesting. But like, so you're a typical young person in a second or third tier city in China. You are seeking educational opportunities. You're seeking stuff to do because broadcast TV in China sucks largely. There's not a lot of entertainment per se as a young person if you live in one of these second or third tier cities. Enter something like YY. You get on there. It is a group-based video and voice-based communication service, so you can get on there with your friends after work, take an English language lesson, play World of Warcraft together, and then go to like a virtual nightclub, like a karaoke type of nightclub, and you know there are consumers spending tens and hundreds and thousands of dollars to make themselves look cool in front of their peers, and you'll have 10,000 people in the same chat room you know, with their own avatars, and it's insane. It's insane, but the engagement of this business, the average user spends four to six hours a day on this service. You literally get home from work and like you spend four to six hours a day on this. It's insane, so. Worse than um, no. Can I just add that um, I think it's a wonderful description of that business model. I, I think consumer <laughs> insight, I, I think the consumer insight there is that loneliness is big business. Yeah. <laughs> Which has helped to make New York City thrive, according to Brian. That's one of the reasons uh, BC has taken off, angel investing has taken off here. What about Xiaomi? Uh, that's another example you, you mentioned, being really innovative from China. And I'm, I'm going to get to India next, too. But uh, what about Xiaomi? Tell, what's so innovative about this smartphone maker from China? Uh, their, their founder, Lei Jun, who is on the board uh, of Huawei with me, um, he's a genius. I mean, he's, he's a stud. Like, people call him the Steve Jobs of China, and I, I mean, he just is. Uh, everything he touches turns to gold. Uh, so my advice to investors in China is uh, follow, follow the genius. Um, Xiaomi is basically, uh, you know, people refer to it as, you know, the Apple of China. They've really innovated from a retail perspective, and so rather than open stores, uh, the same way that, you know, Alibaba is basically the Walmart of China. They're not the Amazon of China. They're actually the Walmart of China. So for perspective, 
I don't know about you guys, but I have two kids, and we have an, you know one or two Amazon packages. It seems like show up every day at my house uh, from diapers.com or whatever. Amazon owns a tremendous market share of e-commerce and retail in the United States. It's about two and a half percent of total retail. Alibaba has three times the market share of retail in China that Amazon does in the U.S. Just think about that for a second. However big you think Amazon is in the U.S., Alibaba is three times the size. And the reason is because there's no players like Walmart, really, in China that are as... Uh, so, anyways, the internet plays a disproportionate role in China and many emerging markets. Xiaomi realized this, and they retail their phones online. So they'll uh, have this huge waiting list of people waiting on, you know, the same way that people are queuing up outside Apple stores when the new iPhone comes out. It's the same thing, people getting on a waiting list for the new Xiaomi phone in China online. And they've just built this tremendous brand, great technology. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a and phenomenal it's business. They're very inexpensive too, aren't they? Yeah, price the right way. That's another issue in, in emerging markets, why oftentimes local players tend to win. Right. And you start, you're starting to see this in the enterprise space too. You know, Workday and Salesforce and these companies are you know, great companies, but local versions of those are actually winning in many of these emerging markets because for your average enterprise in Sao Paulo or Rio or Moscow or Beijing, yeah. uh, you just have to price things the right way. And Xiaomi, they've, um, they really understand that in China. So that what kind of... Yeah. Did you want to add? Only yeah. if you wanted to continue on with the China e-commerce story. I don't yeah, know if that's I, relevant I want to, to shift the to India soon too, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I think that the big story about China's e-commerce uh, is, is that from out of nowhere four years ago where e-commerce was only 2% of total retail sales, it has now grown to a legitimate channel of 10%. And so as an industry, that means that it's a $300 billion industry with about $300 billion consumers spending about $1,000 per capita per annum. And that's what's really exciting. And, and, um, and so that is why there's such hype around e-commerce and such hype around Alibaba. The other thing that's very exciting about it is that the penetration of e-commerce in China today is really only limited to a few categories. Right? When you really narrow it down, it's really consu the, uh, consumer electronics, fashion retail, uh, and a bit of cosmetics. So really, in a world of consumption and everything that you think about what you need to buy in at home, most of it is really under-penetrated under, under today. And the three fastest growing uh, e-commerce spend categories in China today is number one, travel, which is really the number one category in the US. Second of all, group buying, and thirdly, utilities payment. So that is really just going to be even bigger in terms of e-commerce spending to come. And then the final driver that I think everybody's really excited about is really the mobile consumption. Today, mobile consumption is growing at about, mobile e-commerce that is, it's growing about 170% year on year. So folks are not shopping only between the hours of 10 to 12 when they're at work and three to five before they go home, but they're also doing so on their mobile phone anywhere, anytime. So, um, so all of these things we believe are going to converge and really deliver the next big tsunami of consumption and, and, and unlock a whole lot of value uh, in a lot of these companies. Uh, so we talked about uh, three of the leading uh, technology innovation markets in the world, uh, US, China, Israel. Uh, what about India? Uh, with a new government in place, there are some Indian startups that are getting attention now globally. Uh, getting ready to go public here in the U.S. Is India going to follow China's lead? Tony, I know your firm does investing in China yeah, I mean, and look, India. You know, um, I, mean, there, I think there's, you know, certainly uh, distinctions that you'd have to make. I think we've um, been a little more cautious in, in and around India in the last couple of years. Uh, not, um, not necessarily because the market was overheated, because you know obviously there was a lot of contraction and there was currency issues and a little less stability in our mind. We think that's changed pretty dramatically uh, with this recent change in the government, <clears throat> and we think um, you know it's still super early. And so, uh, whenever there's sort of a uh, a new group um, in government, you know there's there's only at the beginning anything you know everything but hope and 
an aspiration for what could come, but I do think that there's a lot more constructive uh, comments coming out of the government and what we see on the ground, a lot more constructive feeling around um, uh, the environment. So we think you know foreign investment and uh, local investment should pick up. Uh, we actually think that the consumer trends, that uh, some of which we touched on here around uh, China, are also playing out in a big way. Uh, in India, what you don't have is you know the big success cases yet. Uh, you know, in the e-commerce space, you've got you know really two companies um, that have sort of broken out, and so we think you know this, the internet sector will follow. So travel is a little more advanced uh, in India than, than actually in, in some cases the e-commerce companies. Uh, and so that's following suit, like you saw in the US a long time ago in, in, uh, in China. And a lot of basic industry uh, opportunities as well, which, you know, technology is not infusing all the basic industries, but we're a little more um, of a generalist in, in our investing activity in India. We, that's, that has actually been a lot more correlated with the overall economic climate and because we're more constructive than that, we, we feel like there's some really good opportunities going forward. So, <coughs> were you, were you thinking positive. about Flipkart and Mintra? Yeah, I mean, I, you yeah, know, I mean, Flipkart in particular, house. I think, is the one that you know, our perspective. We're not an investor, by the way, so yeah. I'm talking up somebody else's okay. book here. But um, uh, your former colleagues at Tiger. Uh, but um, <clears throat> you know, we think that's sort of the breakout company there. Okay. Uh, and I think, you know, India, you know, will be afforded a lot of the same benefits that China and other emerging markets have had, which is there are a lot of cultural idiosyncrasies and a lot of specific reasons why, you know, localized companies, localized experiences will, will succeed and, and probably prevail over the big long global dominant companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's such a huge economy with a population that's becoming mobile that a lot of the in particular consumption will get unlocked here in the next decade or so. Well, uh, great. Uh, any burning question from the audience? Uh, yes, right here. And if you would please uh, identify yourself. And uh, our mic. Uh, let's get a mic to him, please. We'll get three up here. Hi, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Yang. Uh, and your affiliation? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm vice president of a venture club called the MIT China Innovation and Entrepreneurship Forum. Uh, Actually, I, uh, I came from China and I have lived in the U.S. for the five, uh, past five years. So from entrepreneur point of view, I do think there's a bubble in the tech world. Why? Because whether there's a bubble or not, it depends from whose perspective you look at this problem. Because yeah. usually people ask this question uh, to venture capitalists. So uh, actually, uh, my, question, my question was uh, the chairman of the Fed just uh, made a claimation that in the next five years, the overall US economy will still be in kind of a, a recession. So uh, how do you think the venture capital as an industry could drive the US economy uh, and retake re the responsibility okay. uh, to take over the economy when they see more deals uh, on those smart, uh, validated business mm -hmm. model companies like Airbnb, Uber, <coughs> and uh, some other social apps, rather than just breakthrough technologies. Okay. Well, BC, how are we going to change the world? <laughs> you know, uh, look, um, <clears throat> you know, I think the, it, it's, it, it's a really complex question to answer. I mean, I, I think it's, it's hard to draw generalities around the U.S. global economy not growing as much as, you know, pockets of it. Uh, you know, I think what I could say in common on probably is what I know more than, than the overall economy, which is in the tech sector. I think we, we probably haven't seen this level of fundamental innovation, uh, you know, ever in our cycle. And it's happening across, you know, fundamental platform shifts. It's in computing. It's happening across, uh, you know, really the needs of the enterprise and the complexity of the, the needs of the software architecture of the enterprise. And it's happening in consumer. And so that all, you know, has you know really fundamentally exciting ingredients for company formation, and um, and I think that in a, in particular also adds to you know job growth and all the other fundamental contributors to overall economic stability and, and growth. The problem is that you know the tech sector is still not you know the majority of the U.S. economy, and so at the end of the day, you know its ability to kind of contribute is only is limited in some ways by. Uh, your will share of the economy, which is growing, by the way, but still, uh, you know, could have, you know, 
can be more limited because of the other other industries that are having a more dampening impact.